Greetings everyone and welcome to the fifth lecture of the second issue of our Bulletin of Near Eastern Excavations and Research. I am Valentina Santini and I will moderate this encounter. Um, as you may know, if you attended our previous lectures, the Bulletin, which is focused on uh, ongoing projects and archaeological excavations in the Near East, is intended for the scientific community, uh, university students, uh, but also the general public. And at the end of each lecture, there's a section dedicated to questions. Therefore, if you do have questions, please use the live chat of YouTube. And at the end of the presentation, I will read your comments to our speaker. And today's speaker is Michele Nucciotti from the University of Florence who will talk about Crusader Ayyubid and Mamluk settlement in southern Jordan, recent results from the Italian archaeological mission in Petra and Shobak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentina, and uh, um, thank you, all the um, listeners. Um, and, and many thanks, uh, first of all, to Camnes for the invitation of the Italian archaeological mission in Petra and Shobak to this um, second edition of the Bulletin of Near Eastern Excavations and Research. Uh, so uh, my topic today uh, will be um, related to the most recent results of our archaeological excavations in uh, Southern Jordan and particularly in the area of Petra and Shoba um, and uh, for the medieval epoch, uh, and uh, particularly regarding Crusader Ayyubid and Mamluk settlement in southern Jordan. Uh, the Italian archaeological mission in Petra uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, the largest medievalist an archaeological mission abroad, and it was founded in 1986 by Professor Guido Vanini, uh, who directed the uh, archaeological mission until uh, 2018. Um, as to myself, I started my work in this mission, serving as a team member from 1996, and then I, I served as co-director uh, of the archaeological mission uh, since uh, 2003 and up to 2018. And finally, um, I, I became director of the archaeological mission in 2019 and 2020, despite 2020 season due to the COVID pandemic was uh, quite a peculiar one. But anyway, it was also important, we will see in uh, my report, uh, um, on one side, because we somehow managed to have some on-field activity in Jordan, uh, thanks to the collaboration with a no-profit uh, organization. And uh, besides, uh, it was uh, also important for us because we could um, uh, review and, uh, um, and reconsider uh, and also advance with uh, some analysis uh, on the materials that we had collected in previous uh, seasons. Uh, well, the um, archaeological mission uh, is a mission of the University of Florence, uh, but also uh, we have two important uh, institutional partners. Uh, first of all, uh, the Department of Antiquities of Jordan and also the uh, Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Italian in Amman and to this um, very important for us uh, institutional partners of course uh, goes all my gratitude uh, on behalf of the University of Florence and the rest uh, uh, of the team. Um, uh, well let's start from let's say the beginning uh, when uh, the mission was uh, started in the 1980s uh, the primary goal was to assess the original forms of medieval settlement in Transjordan 
in Crusader Ayyubid epoch. This is important because um, it was not, even if uh, our main in, uh, sites, I mean, those uh, that we have investigated more deeply uh, in the first 20 years of, the, uh, of activity in Jordan uh, were, let's say, they uh, part of the Crusader settlement in, in Transjordan. Uh, the mission uh, since its origin and uh, due to the will of uh, Guido Vannini did not focus uh, specifically or we may say only on crusader uh, aspects of the settlement and culture, but on crusader Ayubid. So there was this, let's say, link between uh, West and East uh, that uh, had been originally established in, um, in the aims, general aims of the archaeological mission. And we will see that we uh, particularly developed this initial uh, idea of Guido uh, with a Mediterranean, Euro-Mediterranean contextualization at first and more recently with, uh, within an Eurasian contextualization of the Middle Ages. Uh, so as to the Crusader settlement in uh, Transjordan, uh, here we can see um, a very uh, schematic uh, map of the main settlements uh, that were uh, built uh, or resettled uh, by the Crusaders between 1100 and 1142, and they lasted uh, as uh, the Lordship of Transjordan until the Battle of Hattin uh, of 1187, and the reconquest of all Transjordan by Salah ad -Din, uh, in 1189. So if we take a look to this map, uh, we may have uh, the, um, let's say, the, the idea that settlement more or less repeated uh, the settlement of the Roman or Romano-Byzantine Limes Arabicus which is, let's say, one of the um, comparable uh, settlement strategies that is uh, very often um, considered for analyzing uh, medieval Transjordan. Uh, well, this is, let's say, uh, at the same time, uh, true and false. Uh, it is true in that... Uh, um, also the Crusader settlement from uh, Kerak to uh, Isla, Aqaba, and then the Isle of Pharaohs or Ile de Grey uh, in front of Sinai, uh, had more or less the same uh, aim of controlling uh, the easternmost arable land uh, of, of the Levant, and in this case, the lands of uh, across and east of the Jordan River and the uh, Wadi Araba. Uh, and also, uh, at the same, let's say, another similarity with the Limes Arabicus is that this network uh, of, of settlement uh, was also instrumental uh, for the Crusaders that uh, I prefer to call uh, uh, Latin, um, Latin lords, uh, uh, European Latin lords that settled uh, in Palestine and then Transjordan. It was instrumental to have this elite, this new military elite, uh, having contacts with the Bedouins and so with the uh, tribal uh, groups uh, and armed tribal groups that uh, lived uh, in the desert and in the in the Badia uh, uh, of Jordan. Uh, but from another point of view, uh, the uh, medieval frontier, uh, and so this long string of settlement between Kerak and uh, the Red Sea, uh, 
was very different from the uh, ancient Limes Arabicus because this type of medieval settlement is not uh, urban based, it's not city based. Uh, the frontier does not respond to a capital city. Uh, and in fact, is not structurally connected to any capital city. And each settlement somehow uh, is at the center of an administrative uh, and also military and also uh, lordly uh, region uh, that, uh, of course, is um, is run uh, in a system with all the others, but it can be autonomous for most of, uh, of its needs. And, and this is uh, the, let's say, the uh, outcome of the development of the uh, medieval society in Europe, uh, of which the, the Crusaders or Latin Lords were like um, uh, witnesses and also uh, they, they, they were, let's say, those who propelled the similar society also uh, in the east. So uh, we see from this uh, map that uh, our area, uh, our main area of interest is that of Petra and Schobach. Uh, for Petra, we have like a close up uh, of the Petra in which we can see that uh, there are a number of uh, sites that are mentioned in uh, medieval written sources and also that are preserved as archaeological uh, sites nowadays, and particularly uh, the two castles of Alueira, uh, called in the Middle Ages Livo Moises, or the Valley of Moses, um, because, of course, um, modern day uh, village of Wadi Musa, uh, also in its name in Arabic, uh, recalled the Valley of Moses, the valley where Moses uh, hitting with his stick, uh, the rock uh, had a, a water spring gushing out uh, for uh, the benefit of the people of uh, Israel that was crossing the, the desert during the, the Exodus. And so Alueira is this site, we'll see it in more detail in a while. And then Al Habis, uh, which is another very important castle, uh, possibly uh, to be um, associated with the um, uh, written sources uh, that name uh, in Arabic a castle of Al Asuit, and possibly with the um, uh, European and Latin uh, written medieval sources. Uh, that speak of a castle called Sela, like Sela, uh, from uh, the Greek uh, stone, which is like a Greek translation for Petra. Uh, one of the first uh, results of the archaeological mission was to actually conceive of this uh, castle system in southern Jordan uh, as uh, an incastellamento so example, so to, let's say, uh, make, make it uh, and understand its similarities to um, Southern European and Mediterranean uh, castle systems. Uh, and, uh, and this is, let's say, the outcome of the first uh, settlement of the new Latin lords in Petra, uh, because we, we see that uh, in, in place of the ancient city uh, that was, uh, of course, abandoned since the uh, Persian <clears throat> and Arab um, conquest, uh, so in the uh, in seventh century, uh, the new lords did not build a new city because uh, these lords were rural lords, were uh, used to rule the land from the land, not from city. And so basically, uh, the valley was settled uh, as 
with, with a pattern that recalls uh, territorial settlement in, in Southern uh, Europe. Uh, and so in, in the medieval Petra is a known city, let's say. It is an incastellamento uh, area that comprises Alueira, Alhabis, and some minor other settlement. And then, uh, of course, Shobak, 25 kilometers to the north of Petra, that was built in 1115 by the first king of Jerusalem, Baldwin I, and became, let's say, a sort of uh, capital castle uh, for Jordan uh, and one of the primary sites in the region for the whole Middle Ages because after the Crusaders left it became at the center of administrative um, district uh, and also of government for the uh, Ayyubid uh, dynasty of Salah ad din and uh, um, Al-Adil Abu Bakr, uh, etc., etc. So this is uh, like a closer picture of the three main sites. Um, up to the left, Alueira, uh, up to the right, Alhabis, uh, and below to the right, Shobak. And a detail of the uh, set medieval settlement of the Valley of Petra, where, as I uh, already mentioned, apart from these castles, uh, we have uh, some other sites that have been more recently uh, excavated and also recognized as 12th century settlements by comparisons with the pottery first excavated and seriated uh, by Guido Vannini, Andrea Vanni Desideri in the excavations of Alueira, uh, and among which particularly important is the um, fortress or stronghold of Wadi Farasa, that was, uh, which was discovered uh, by Stefan Sch uh, Schmidt of Berlin um, University. Uh, well, I just uh, want to show you uh, some pictures because most of our presentation for the medieval Petra project uh, relates to, to the castles, but uh, today, in fact, I'm not speaking, I'm not focusing this presentation on the castles. And so this is kind of sort of a reminder. And also for those who are, uh, who are not familiar with the site uh, to show what level um, of conservation of the structures uh, we have. Of course, they're mostly ruderized structures, uh, but with the, the presence of uh, partially standing or still uh, full standing architectures as this beautiful tower in uh, Alueira. We have much less standing architectures, unfortunately, in Alhabis. Uh, and the only um, architectural pieces that are still visible are those that, uh, let's say, have the benefit of being inserted uh, uh, into semi-rupestrian architectures because uh, the, the most part of the curtain walls and uh, uh, of the main tower and also of the fortified gates, etc., etc., have collapsed. And uh, we can read very well their layout and their structures on a map and so, as it is usual for archaeological sites, but uh, for Alhabis, we really have few standing walls. And this is a pity because most of our mm, research is, uh, is not based on excavation, but on what we call light archaeology, which is a territorial archaeology. So we, we do not consider sites, we consider territories, uh, and uh, we analyze territories with mainly non-destructive methodologies like um, stratigraphic analysis of upstanding walls. Uh, these are not uh, very um, common in sites like Alhabis, but fortunately we have sites like Shobak that uh, um, show 
even today, uh, many medieval buildings to, to their uh, almost full height, uh, apart, of course, from um, another <laughs> as, uh, as large uh, part of uh, medieval buildings that are preserved uh, as, as uh, um, deteriorated or collapsed uh, structures. Uh, so this is for the Crusader epoch, but then we spoke of Crusader Ayubid, uh, and in the Ayubid uh, <coughs> period, we have um, forms of continuity and also of discontinuity um, of the history of the region um, when we consider and compare the Ayubid period with the Crusader one, <coughs> particularly uh, because uh, for the continuity, the Ayyubids, and so Salah din and Al-Adil particularly, but then also Al-Muazzam Isa, and, uh, and then uh, uh, Al-Malik Al-Kamil, etc., etc., uh, preserved Transjordan as a, a lordship, let's say. Uh, and so they somehow um received the, the the inheritance of of the crusader settlement even because uh, transjordan proved particularly successful in crusader epoch in disconnecting uh, syria from egypt or egypt from iraq so it became uh, let's say a, a compulsory place to cross and to deal with in terms of its uh, crusader lordship for all the powers and superpowers of the regions. Uh, heritage uh, was not lost uh, with the Ayubids because they maintained the, the, the structure, let's say, the, the, the regional scope also of Transjordan, uh, but of course they transformed the castle system and the non-urban settlement into an urban-based settlement. And particularly in Shobak, we have the transformation of the uh, 12th century Crusader castle into an Ayyubid uh, regional capital or a rural city, a small city, a Medina, uh, but we is very important politically, as is uh, attested by the presence uh, of several important architecture, and particularly this one that we are watching now in the slide. So uh, the uh, um, uh, audience or reception hall of the Ayubid Palace in uh, Shobak, um, dating uh, between uh, 1190 and before 1212. In 1212, we had a very uh, destructive earthquake in Shobak, uh, and uh, um, the restoration after this earthquake uh, were performed by um, um, a specialized team that used a very um, readable, very recognizable masonry technique that is not um, recorded in this palace, but in fact only in its restoration. So this uh, makes us uh, very confident of dating it before uh, 1212. And this is a beautiful architecture. We have already uh, written about it, about also uh, some, let's say, mirroring of this architecture um, of um, Abbasid architectures in, in ninth century uh, Samarra. So there is continuity, but also this, let's say, transformation of a rural-based uh, settlement system into an urban-based and urban-centered settlement system. Uh, the next slides refers to the activity that we could organize this and we were able to perform this year or last year, 2020, during the COVID pandemic uh, inside of Shobak. And it was um, a remotely controlled activity that was performed by our local partner, um, no profit organization, SELA, for vocational training. Uh, and here we see uh, in, uh, in the slide uh, the catalog 
cataloging of, of uh, stone uh, artifacts from the undercroft of the main church in uh, Schaubach, because uh, we will uh, start in a few months a new project, a new public archaeology project with the Italian Agency for um, uh, the Cooperation of Development uh, for uh, musealization and also uh, for uh, starting training activities um, towards our colleagues of Department of Antiquities and Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. And this lapidarium will be musealized, so we needed to have like a first catalog of, uh, of the artifacts. And thanks to uh, the, the, the tools that we are using given today in this conference, we were able to um, give instruction, follow the work, and then also proceed to 3D modeling with our colleagues of SELA even during this pandemic. Um, finally, this is, let's say, the most recent uh, discovery, uh, in this case, in, I mean, an excavation discovery in the area of Schaubach. Uh, it is uh, related to 2018, uh, and it is a discovery of the so-called Jaya Palace, an Islamic palace located below the castle, uh, where written sources and also our surveys had demonstrated the existence of a lower Medina, the, of Ayyubid and Mamluk epoch. Uh, but for the first time uh, in 2018, we had the opportunity to, um, to watch, uh, to have a closer look also to the an economic level uh, of this uh, lower Medina, uh, thanks to the, the discovery of this uh, beautiful um, palace uh, or uh, palace house, uh, of which we have uncovered uh, one of the courtyard with the central fountain, still preserving the lower order of Mukarna's decoration and um, marble and, uh, um, and stone uh, paving with this beautiful uh, corner uh, mosaic panels. And on, on this site, I, I will uh, say something more about its interpretation at the end of, of my presentation. Uh, so um, what is the theoretical context of our mission? Uh, it is a medievalist context in that uh, we are not uh, specialists of the crusader period uh, we are not specialists of islamic archaeology we are specialists of uh, the medieval epoch and uh, also thanks to our research in western europe and jordan and more recently also in armenia uh, we we could somehow define a framework um, on which we are now working. And this framework is, uh, as, I, as I was saying before, it's not a crusader or pretty much culturally oriented framework or an Islamic archaeology network, but it is a medieval uh, contextualization. So originally we moved within the context of medieval Mediterranean. Today, uh, we are um, refining a concept able to include uh, in the Middle Ages of all Eurasia. And this is like a brief description of, of, of this, uh, of, of our idea of uh, Eurasian Middle Ages as a historic period between the 7th and the 15th century, during which cultural groups characterized by tribal organization settled in antiquity and late antiquity outside the Romano-Byzantine, the Iranian and the Chinese imperial spaces, migrate inside antique empires and establish new regimes. This is what becomes, what is true, what is observable in all Eurasia. Then in the Mediterranean region, in Iran and China, the resulting societies respectively, uh, respectively propelled by Arab, Berber, Turkish, and later Mongol tribes, 
retain a structured administrative and fiscal organization and are urban based. And they can be described as a whole as medieval Eura Eurasian empires. In Europe, former tribal barbarian, mainly Germanic and Slavic groups in progressive connection with Greco-Latin ecclesiastical culture, deeply transform former social and settlement structures, giving origin to a rural-based feudal society. So this is more or less, let's say, our general uh, framework. And this is like a contextualization of our area uh, within the Mediterranean feudal society where our research compares, uh, let's say, Jordan with Tuscany and with other um, territories in Europe. And this is, let's say, a contextualization uh, within the Eurasian uh, imperial context. Uh, from this point of view, uh, the, the Latins, the Frankish uh, groups, uh, or the Franks, as are normally addressed also in the Arab sources, are uh, just another, let's say, of the Asabiat of the Islamic empires. In fact, not different from the Buids, the Seljuks, the Kurds, etc., etc. And in particular, we see this uh, Frankish. Uh, Asabiat, uh, taking powers in several areas of the uh, Western uh, Islamic world with the Reconquista in Northern Spain, in the um, 11th and 12th century, the Norman conquest uh, <clears throat> of part of North Africa, and in the same epoch also. The, the crusade. So uh, the, the, these crusaders somehow are both uh, Latin lords coming from Europe, organizing the lands as they would do in at home, but they can also be perceived from the point of view of the Arab empires, uh, like a military elite taking power uh, in, a, in specific regions, and in this way, in, in a way not very different from other non-Arab military elites as the Buid, the Seljuks, or the Mongols, of course, with much more um, effect and, and fortune. Uh, okay, but I, I will not um, elaborate on this. I'll go to the new results. Uh, so first of all, the thematic survey of 2018 and 19 in the Valley of Petra, conducted by Andrea Vani Desideri and Silvia Leporatti, and addressing monastic hermitage landscape of medieval Petra. This is a very new topic uh, through which um, uh, our mission and particularly Andrea and Silvia uh, could identify a number of uh, monastic and hermitage sites with church, churches, chapels, uh, hermitage and, and springs uh, that somehow form a new layer in the in the um, uh, in the settlement of Petra, better in our knowledge of the settlement of Petra, and this connects with the very first survey to Petra of King Baldwin the first in November eleven hundred, uh, when the court uh, arrived for first time. Petra Valley, uh, and the uh, let's say the objective, the aim of this trip was the monastery of Jebel Harun uh, that was recently excavated and published by the Finnish team and by this big near Fiema. And uh, even though we know that in the 12th century the main church was not in use anymore, uh, the excavation in fact demonstrated the presence uh, and uh, um, the let's say uh, the, the presence of settlement in the same area, in the same uh, monastic compound, even in, in this time. So maybe this was a connection between the crusaders and local um, monastic and eremitic uh, groups and societies. These are uh, some pictures of this uh, or some of these complexes that normally have 
uh, one area for uh, praying or with a small altar or with uh, normally bearing cross graffiti as this one and uh, a cell um, in uh, also um, we could know better thanks to this survey water management and uh, collecting systems uh, water collecting uh, systems and we could reread one of the phases the pre-crusader pre -crusader phases of Alweira castle uh, because in the area of the main keep of Crusader uh, Castle, which is number six, it was uh, possibly uh, already established uh, a Byzantine Laura. Uh, and uh, we have a number of cells uh, in, in the area, and particularly in number seven, we have a request on Byzantine Chapel. Uh, the site was uh, as, um, was previously excavated in the 1980s by our colleague Robin Brown uh, that could recognize 12th century occupation but did not recognize the presence of a chapel. So our next aim would be to understand how and if uh, the hermitage and monastic settlement overlaps also with crusader uh, period and it, it possibly does overlap. So this changes a lot, let's say the, the picture also of, of Crusader Petra. Uh, as to show back, we have recent news from pottery and glass analysis. Uh, pottery analysis, the news are um, mainly due to the studies of Raffaele Ranieri, who's a PhD student at Bonn University under the tutorship of the colleague uh, Bethany Walker. Uh, and uh, um, so thanks to this research, we could reconsider uh, pretty in-depth ceramic production and consumption, Crusader Ayubid and Mamluk periods in Shobak, particularly um, thanks to the identification of a previously unknown medieval wheel throne pottery production, which as we can see here in 12th, 13th century, uh, represents more than 60% of the excava excavated pottery in, in the whole uh, site of Shobak. Uh, while normally most of academic mm, attention uh, for 12th and 13th century pottery production in this area uh, has been given to handmade wares and handmade geometrically painted wares that in fact in Chobak represent only a minor part, like 15% of the whole assemblage. And then we have also imports in glazed wares and fruit wares that as we see are very, um, are, are a small percentage of the assemblage. And, and then of course we have pre-crusader and so um, residual uh, pottery. Um, so this is like a general view of the assemblages of 12th, 13th century. This is a specific assemblage from area, area 35,000, where we can see that anyway, the, um, the Wiltron pottery represents still, I mean, the, the maximum part. This is really something important, uh, even because if we compare that 12th, century, early 13th century assemblage with uh, Mamluk and post-Mamluk period assemblage, uh, we see that the wheel made uh, is, especially in the Mamluk period for area 24,000, uh, is represented in, in a smaller amount while we have handmade wares or painted wares uh, in, in growing proportion. So this is important because it gives us uh, the possibility to start distinguishing Crusader Ayubid and Mamluk uh, assemblages from um, the pottery point of view. Here we have uh, glazed and free tour. This is the uh, handmade uh, painted ware that is, the, let's say, the main subject of most of research on medieval pottery in the area uh, until now. And this is, oh, sorry the wheel made pottery uh, that is really the, the, um, the newcomer in the 
scientific uh, debate and, and given uh, its uh, high percentages in the assemblages, I mean, it becomes like one of the char characteristic aspects of uh, pottery production and consumption. Um, and until this study, normally this type of pottery was considered residual from pre-crusader uh, phases. Um, an important uh, step uh, towards clarifying um, crusader Ayubid and distinguishing between crusader and Ayubid assemblages uh, comes also from the um, beautiful um, work, also PhD the thesis uh, uh, of Elena Casalini on the Shoba glass uh, materials. In this case, uh, the thesis is um, uh, a thesis of University Roma 3 and the tutor is uh, the colleague Antonella ba because Elena could identify in Schaubach uh, production uh, of uh, beakers, but also uh, of, um, of larger containers uh, with uh, a distinctive uh, blue uh, ring that connects this production to a production uh, a Syrian production, particularly uh, focused on the site of Hama. So this connection between Syria and Shobak that is already, we had already documented from the point of view of architecture is confirmed and even more specified thanks to the uh, study of glasses. Uh, and then, of course, we also have um, dishes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What seems very um, interesting is that uh, we do not find glass in uh, in crusader assemblages, and so by let's say uniting uh, the work on ceramics and the work on glasses. Uh, we are closer to, to find, let's say, the distinctive characters of 12th century assemblages. So in particular, in order to distinguish or to be able in some cases to distinguish uh, Crusader assemblages from Ayubi assemblages. Uh, a new frontier of our research uh, is also rural archaeology. So uh, we wanted, let's say, to, to fill the map of Jordan in the Middle Ages that nowadays is too much focused on big castles or um, like the, the most important settlements. So filling the agricultural space. Uh, and this is um, a work that uh, um, we owe to Giacomo Ponticelli, which is, uh, who is one of our MA students and also a member of the mission. Uh, because as we can see in the, um, in the uh, image to the left, uh, Schaubach uh, was connected in the 16th century to a number of caravanserais from Catran, Alhaza, Uneza, Ma on the Aji Road uh, and also to Aqaba, uh, to which Shobak provided agricultural product. We know this from the recent and beautiful research of the colleague Rim Ashokor dedicated to the Aqaba Khans and the Khans of Jordan. And so uh, this uh, rural archaeology part of the project explores the, the let's say, the organization of the rural space. In the area around the castle, we have uh, terracing, some, in some cases is agricultural terracing, in some other cases is a terracing maybe uh, more related to uh, preventing ad hydrogeological uh, issues. Um, so we, we have put together all, all the surveys that were carried out before ours and that are available in the bibliography. We have uh, repositioned all the sites and of course we have added new sites. Uh, and this is one of the sites that we plan to start uh, digging possibly already in 2021, where we can see uh, that in Shbeka, uh, we have like a, um, a core, uh, which is a settlement, a cellular settlement. Uh, 
ground, we have um, like crop uh, uh, or uh, agricultural preparations of the terrain. And also uh, we have um, crushing stones uh, for uh, olives and also for, for wheat. So an area of agricultural transformation. We are working with the uh, written sources, etc., etc. For now, the survey of these specific sites um, gave us important, uh, let's say, signs from the point of view of uh, the present pottery of its uh, potential medieval origin. We have uh, some uh, comparable uh, examples from the area of Wadi Musa and in particular the important site of Herbert Nawafle um, that was uh, excavated in the early um, 2000 uh, by Khairiye Amr and the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. So we hope we will be able to, to, to know next year something more about the agricultural production which is so important for uh, the, the the richness of Shobak, also for the success of Shobak in the Middle Ages, both Crusader Ayyubid and Mamluk epoch. And finally, we are at the Jaya Palace. Um, and uh, for the interpretation of this site, we have also the same Professor Giovanni Curatola of uh, Udine University, who is a member of our team and also our first advisor for Islamic uh, archaeology, uh, because in this site, as I was uh, saying before, we can see uh, both the, the urban change after the Crusader epoch uh, happening in Shobak with this beautiful architecture that you normally we found some, uh, let's say, comparisons, for instance, in Cairo, but there's nothing else at the moment known from archaeological evidence in, in uh, Jordan, but also uh, for the end of that Medina. So for the second ruralization, as we can see in this uh, uh, desertion or abandonment layer uh, that uh, dates to the 15th or 16th century, to the end of Mamluk or early Ottoman period, in which this uh, city uh, comes to an end, an abrupt end, abrupt end, uh, as, as we can see, and the whole area loses uh, administrative and political centrality and, and uh, is reincorporated, let's say, in, in, in the rural Ottoman um, uh, settlement patterns uh, that is typical of most of Jordan and particularly of Southern Jordan. So what we can see, what we can say about this palace. Uh, so uh, can we read this palace as like uh, a counterpart for the Ayyubid palace in the castle? Uh, well, maybe, possibly, why not? Uh, in that, uh, it can be like uh, the, um, the making of a, a wealthy inhabitant of Shobak that, may, that maybe wants to imitate somehow the feature of the, of the government palace, uh, who is uh, uh, located in the, in the citadel, in the Kalat, uh, even if, of course, this pattern is a very common pattern, but in this case, it's not common enough. We have seen it's not common enough in Jordan, so maybe this space organization uh, can create or there, there is a relationship between the, the two palaces or because also this lower palace uh, was part of an estate of an elite group, a politically uh, eminent group that was also in political control. So like a repetition of the upper palace or it was like, uh the, in, in in let's say the property of an uh, an exponent of an economic elite that was not part of the political elite and that wanted like to use similar forms 
platforms in order to um, to to attest its his or her participation or his family and her family participation to to the um, to the ruling class in in in, in Shobat. Uh, then as to dating, uh, unfortunately, we could actually perform only the first season of the excavation and uh, uh, because the, the um, palace lays in private property, but um, talks uh, have been concluded as far as we know between the Department of Antiquities and the owners and so it would be possible for us to restart the excavation in 2021. Uh, so from the first let's say, season, uh, we have some ideas also of the dating and the connection in particular with Mamlu Cairo, because we have similar are colors and patterns uh, in mosaics, both wall mosaics and floor mosaics in um, Mamluk uh, mausoleums, uh, for instance, of Kalaun, dating to the end of 13th century in, in Cairo, or uh, to a later of some uh, 50, 60 years, uh, mosque and madrasa complex uh, by, uh, of Sultan Nasir, An -Nasir uh, Hassan, uh, dating to 1356 uh, or 59. So, I mean, our idea is, I mean, the dating is Mamluk, possibly already at the end of 13th century, but possibly also extending to the half of 14th century. Uh, very relevant are the remains of stucco decoration that possibly, uh, that for sure cover the, the walls uh, and the mm, tripartite walls and niches that uh, is still standing on the southern side of the courtyard. And uh, we, we can easily read in the walls um, the, the nails for connecting the stucco decoration to uh, the wall um, uh, proper. Uh, and also we have uh, a very important um, piece uh, of Chinese celadon ware that we are now studying. It's not the only one. We have also small pieces coming from the Shobak excavation, but this is by far the let's say the, the the biggest that we have we know that celadon is very uh well represented in uh, important museum collections but from excavation we very rarely have pieces much larger than than these uh, and it is a celadon uh, connected possibly uh, to the um, northern production of uh, uh, Song or uh, Yuan, so again, 13th and 14th century. And if from this, let's say, Celadon, allow me on this final slide to recontextualize the Jaya Palace uh, within the Eurasian Empire. So we have left, let's say, the, the Euro-Mediterranean contextualization. Now we move towards Eurasia and in particular within the network uh, of the so-called Silk Road uh, uh, that has been the subject of a very important ICOMOS thematic study in 20. 14 by uh, Tim Williams uh, that uh, showed how the Silk Road uh, was not, as we know about silk and was not really a road, it's more like a, a terrestrial and uh, sea oceanic uh, network that connects uh, all parts of Eurasia. And also it has not, let's say a main direction from East to West as uh, it was the original idea of Silk Roads uh, from the 19th century, but in fact also allow, uh, allows a transfer of people and knowledge from South to North as happened for the Buddhism from India uh, to China, Tibet, etc., uh, etc., et or uh, for the Islam from, um, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula.
peninsula uh, to the Mediterranean and to um, Central uh, and uh, uh, Western and uh, uh, Central Asia. Uh, so uh, let's say we, with this conclusion, uh, this is, let's say, a conclusion of, a, of one season, but also of a period of the archaeological mission uh, Medieval Petra uh, that somehow we use as a, uh, as a main testimony of the possibility of considering uh, a new global framework centered on the Middle Ages uh, for better understanding and integrating the different historical and archaeological narratives uh, into, let's say, a, a single global discourse um, for Eurasia and for the Middle Ages. And I thank you very much for your attention. Many, many thanks for your extremely fascinating lecture. Thank you so much. Um, now, as I mentioned right before the, the proper beginning of the presentation, this final part is dedicated to questions and comments. Uh, therefore, if you would like to comment on the topic of this lecture, uh, you can use the live chat of YouTube and I'm going to read your comments or your questions uh, to our speaker. Uh, since for the moment, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any questions, I would like <laughs> to ask you something. And um, uh, I would like uh, to learn a bit more about uh, the relationship between uh, um, contemporary local communities uh, and uh, the archaeological site. So what kind of relation is there uh, between local communities and uh, your archaeological mission? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for this question, because in this presentation, actually, I, I skipped our, let's say, commitment to public archaeology, uh, through which uh, we have worked uh, a lot, I mean, for understanding uh, the relation between our archaeological site, our <laughs> there and all, <laughs> all the archaeological sites of Shobak and and uh, um, and local community. Well, when we started our research uh, on Shobak, so that it was like two thousand and two year two thousand, maybe the first year, then two thousand and two, the first campaign. And until uh, recently, until I would say 2013, uh, there was like a, a very complex uh, relationship between local communities and these archaeological sites. It was apparent, for instance, in the absence of tourist signs indicating the way for reaching the castle from the main road of the modern village that by the way, it is the main road connecting Amman to Petra. So it is uh, like a road crossed by hundred thousand visitors every every year. And, and there was no sign to this castle. Then, I mean, there was only one sign, but without the distance. So uh, like the Shoba castle was indicated as other sites that mm, could lay many kilometers away, dozens of kilometers away from the road. Uh, and, uh, and there was only like a limited uh, tourist activity uh, by a, a local um, entrepreneur uh, that opened, had opened um, a small camping facility plus another, um, which I mean, good friend of ours, uh, um, Abu Ali, that owned a small souvenir shop. And so, uh, well, we understood, especially uh, between 2009 and 2012, where we first developed a European project of public archaeology in the area, uh, that the, the castle was too much, let's say, or uniquely associated uh, with the crusader uh, 
theme, and not just in terms of tourism, but also in terms of culture. And, and, and we understood that this could be a problem uh, for, uh, let's say, for, for the local community to feel completely at home within this castle. So since in parallel, we were developing our research and we were uncovering that the former Crusader castle then became, thanks to Salah and uh, and uh, uh, Al-Adil uh, Abu Bakr, the center also of an Islamic Medina, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we decided to organize, uh, to set up some public initiatives for presenting these results, uh, particularly the, um, um, in 2008, we organized an international conference in Florence. Uh, in 2009, we organized with the Department of Antiquities of Jordan an international exhibition in, in Florence. Uh, and then uh, about uh, from Petra to Shob, Archaeology of a Frontier, presenting, let's say, this, uh, the way how Shobak is transformed into an Islamic city in the, at the end of the 12th century. Uh, and then we worked with several partners like with Sela for vocational training um, for uh, presenting these historical results to different targets like um, school population, uh, or of course the tourists, uh, of course the municipality with, 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 with which we worked. It was uh, our partner in the European uh, project. And uh, let's say slowly, slowly, now maybe I don't have it here. Anyway, what we observed is that um, the community started to revendicate the, 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 the castle, let's say. Uh, and uh, after uh, 2016, we observed the appearance on the main road of Schaubach of works of uh, street art uh, by locals uh, depicting the castle and the lower Medina. And uh, more recently, maybe in 17 or 18, uh, the municipality of Schobach decided to restyle the municipal building, uh, redesigning it uh, in, with the insertion of some architectural recalls of Mamluk towers, uh, 13th century, end of the 13th century Mamluk Towers in Shobak. And uh, the same municipality decided to, uh, to build at the boundaries of the municipal territory uh, two tourist gates or like uh, entry gates to the to the municipal territory that are styled uh, as the gates of the fortress. So somehow like this, the, the Shoba community now really wants not just to be part, but feels itself as integral, as inside the castle. And, uh, and this is, I mean, something that also produced uh, um, very good outcomes in terms of occupation of tourism. Uh, we managed to help the local community to open a new uh, hotel in which uh, 48 locals uh, were hired and they could get a job in the, um, in the cultural sector and they're still, I mean, working apart from this 2020 pandemic year that of course uh, was not helpful for uh, uh, for anybody uh, living uh, on this planet. Uh, but also we learned a lot from local communities because when we were presenting the European project, thanks to our colleagues of the municipality with several meetings with uh, specific families, groups of families, etc., etc., informing them about the relevance of the castle and so and so, 
uh, on our tour, on our turn, we were informed by these families of the links connecting today's modern families to uh, abandoned villages in the area of Shobak. And this is, let's say, the start also of our project of rural archaeology, because we started uh, analyzing, documenting these villages, and we provided, together with the municipality, tourist signs that from the main road indicate with the kilometers, also with the distance, <laughs> the, the presence and the distance of these villages. Uh, and so uh, let's say that it, it is a, a very uh, beautiful example for us of how public engagement from the part of archaeologists can help a public engagement from the part of the community. And it's not just a, a unidirectional uh, influence coming from the people who know the things towards the people who don't know the things. In, in this uh, network, uh, the archaeologists and the residents are in alternate turns, the people who teach and the people who learn. And so, and we hope that with the new project sponsored by the Italian Cooperation Agency for Development, uh, and where we will have as partner also an important UN agency, UNOPS, and we last until 2023, we, we hope that we could consolidate, uh, let's say this integration of archaeology into modern needs and life of the community. Many thanks and congratulations for your massive work on that. So thank you so much. Uh, in the meantime, there's a question. So I'm going to read. Uh, um, is there any evidence of the 1202 and 1259 earthquakes in the archaeological record in that area? Did they create any damages there for structures or were, there, or were they affected by some other quakes later on? So we have um, a very uh, good evidence of the 1212 earthquake because uh, of course that was described uh, and we know that in Shobak, uh, the curtain towers were falling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And th thanks to our light archaeology, we could identify uh, reparation rebuildings that uh, rebuildings that rebuild and transform crusader structures, so uh, structures dating up to 1189, uh, with a similar technique that we find in all the castle. And by the way, that is also the moment, the main, um, let's say, the main moment in which we can observe the transformation of the Crusader castle into uh, an Islamic capital city. Uh, let me see. Okay. Because, for instance, we have uh, with the same technique uh, that were used for repairing the, the curtain walls, we have the, the new building of a brand new quarter around a rectified street and and uh, and all these buildings here are connected stratigraphically and uh, okay here we see like some of them uh, and they are all characterized by a typical uh, masonry type and we have started in 2019 an excavation of one of these um, structures, and uh, it proved to be a ubit. So we we are 
quite sure. Uh, we do not have much evidence of the 1229 until now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the chat in order to see if there's uh, any more question, but it seems uh, we, we don't have uh, um, any other questions. Um, yeah, I confirm we don't have uh, any more questions. So I would like to thank you once more for your really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to thank our public as well, as usual. Thank you so much for being with us. We really hope you enjoyed this lecture. And our next encounter would be next Wednesday, so February the 24th, at 5 p.m. Italy time, as usual. Uh, Glenn Schwartz will talk about uh, investigating a second millennium BC North Mesopotamian city excavations at Kurd Kaburstan, Kurdistan, Iraq. So thank you so much again. And thank you, you, Valentina, and thank you, thank everybody. You.